Hello, welcome to the Black Lives Matter radio show. I am here with two amazing people. I'm Hope Katz Gibbs, creator of Incandescent, and you are on my Facebook page. So all of our friends, thank you so much for tuning in. Tony Farmer is the host of Black Lives Matter. This is actually our 14th episode, but first wow. one that we're doing tonight on Facebook Live. Very exciting for all of us. Um, BlackLivesMatterRadioShow.com is the direct link. And we also post these on YouTube at BlackLivesMatterTV.us. But tonight, you are in for a treat. You're going to meet Dr. Steve Robbins, an author, entrepreneur, amazing story that he has. He's an immigrant. He's been through like, just remarkable things. And now his his life's work is to bring diversity and inclusion to everyone. So I'm going to throw this over to Tony. Tony's in DC. Steve is in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I'm here in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Thrilled to be bringing us all together to share these Black Lives Matter stories. So Tony, I'm going to kick it over to you to interview Steve. Steve is, listen, uh, it is such a pleasure to be able to chat with you once again. Steve and I have done some work in the professional sense. Uh, he's helped me out. Uh, a couple of times. And I want to start off, there's so many different directions we could take our conversation. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. he, you know, everything we do, uh, no matter what the what the topic area is, I like to have a little fun. I yeah, love to yeah. have fun. And so even though we talk about serious topics, and we talk about game changing events that are happening in our society, it is most important to me to pepper a little fun in there. So Steve, just a little bit about your background. You are one of the few people that I know who can actually sing the rap straight out of Compton <laughs> and be authentic with it. Tell us a little bit about your background in that regard. So I came here as a little kid from Vietnam and I grew up in the Compton, Long Beach, uh, Bellflower area. So beast to the east, the east side of Compton, right? So that's, that's where I'm from. Um, but people will look at me now, they wouldn't know. So I can actually wear this t-shirt straight out of Compton, grew up, uh, grew up kind of being a bad little kid. <laughs> I've reformed though, I've reformed. Yes, yes. <laughs> now, um, you are known in the industry as a diversity and inclusion yeah. expert. Yeah. In reality, you're more than that, and that wasn't necessarily your path. Tell us about your path and tell you how you tell us how you ended up in diversity and inclusion work. So I, I might make make you all cry if I tell the whole story. You want me to tell the whole story? Tell the whole story, please. First of all, first of all, I am not a diversity and inclusion guy. I, I people corner me into that area, but I tell people uh, I study human behavior. My PhD is in the field of communication and social neuroscience. So what I do is I look at how um, how other people's words and actions impact and actually shape our brain over time and then how our brain influences to act when we're around other people. How did I get to that spot? Well, we got to go back all the way back to Vietnam. Uh, I came to, uh, to the United States uh, in 1970. In that year, my mom married an American serviceman there, not necessarily because she loved him, but also to take me to the U.S. and take me to a safer place. The war was escalating in those years, 68, 69, 70, and it was becoming more dangerous where we lived. So my mom decides to marry this guy, but in, in, in deciding that and, and taking us over here, she automatically, she simultaneously makes the decision to leave our whole family behind. And that pains my mom a great deal because in Vietnamese culture, family means everything, right? You're, you're nothing without your family. Your identity is tied to your family. In fact, if you were to come to me in Vietnam and you asked, who are you? Uh, my response, my traditional response would be, I am the son of. I am the brother of. I would give you my family name first, not my individual name, okay? So it pains my mom and me a great deal to leave family behind. They can't come with us. To offset some of that pain, my mom tries to teach me some things um, that she learned about the United States as she was growing up. She tried to teach me powerful concepts embedded in words that many, if, if not all of us, are very familiar with. Words that sound like these. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal that they're endowed by the creator with certain unalienable rights, that among those rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Great concepts. She tried to teach me great things about the United States like this. The United States is one of very few places across the globe where you could come with nothing except for the shirt on your back, but end up with something if you worked hard enough. 
Um, she forgot to tell me about it's good to know people too <laughs> because relationships <laughs> matter, right? Right, not right. Just about picking yourself up by your own bootstraps. Many people do that um, and still don't get very far. Okay? Mm. So, anyway, we, we finally land into Los Angeles. We get off the plane, go into this building where we're processed as immigrants. Um, and as we, uh, we're done there, we walk into a corridor. And as we walk in this corridor, there are people lined on either side of the corridor. As we walk further in, some of those people begin throwing things at me and my mom. And these were not good things. S some of them spat on us as we walked by. Some of them yelled horrible words at us as we passed by. I didn't understand English at the time, but I knew these were not good words by the way people were yelling them. I remember my mom putting her arm around me. All four foot 11, 95 pounds of this young Vietnamese woman trying to protect her only son from the things that people were throwing at us. And, and as we'd walk further and further, sometimes the pelting become harder and harder. My mom would instinctively, instinctively squeeze tighter and tighter. And sometimes she would squeeze to so tightly that it would hurt. On those occasions, I'd look up, I'd want to say something to my mom, but I never did. Because every time I looked up, all I saw was tears streaming down my mom's face. And even as a little five-year-old, I knew I should be silent at the time. We, we weren't treated very well when we first arrived here. We were these, uh, these outsiders, these, these folks who didn't look like what some thought were Americans. We didn't fit that mental model of what American was. We were these immigrants coming to their land, they forgetting that we are a land of immigrants, right? Anyway, I grew up, as I said, in some tough areas around LA. Um, often get bloodied and beaten. If I, I got into a school, you'd learn to be tough in my neighborhood. Um, but as I look back upon those painful experiences, I don't think about my pain. A as a parent, I think about what my mom went through every day when she sent me off to school and had to wait many hours to find out how much blood might be on me when I came home from school. Imagine trying to be a productive person with all that stress on you, taking care of your only son. And not only that, see the guy that my mom married? Uh, not very cool. I was never really close to him. It's hard to get close to someone who beats you when you're a minute late for dinner and who beats you again when you can't finish your dinner because you aren't hungry from the first beating. This guy uh, was psychologically and physically abusive to my mom and me. And then in 1984, he was convicted of raping my little sister. And because of that, she was, uh, and because of she, the way she was treated as a biracial child in school, my sister runs away from home with a friend of hers in the summer of 85. One month after my sister runs away, my mom gets a phone call from a detective in the King County Sheriff's Department, Seattle, Washington. And in so many words, the detective says to my mom, he says, Mrs. Robbins, we found the other girl that your daughter ran away with. But that other girl had been sexually assaulted and bludgeoned to death. And, and, and as soon as he says that, my mom asks, what about my daughter? What about Diane? What do you know about her? And all the detective could say was, we don't know. There's no trace of your daughter. We don't know. There's no evidence of your daughter. We don't know. There are no leads to follow. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. All I could say over and over to my mom's questions was, we don't know. That was 1985. It's 2021 now, and we still don't know. See, my sister's believed to be killed by the Green River Killer. This serial killer murdered dozens of young women in the Green River area of Seattle, Washington in the 80s and 90s. My sister believes, uh, I mean, my, uh, the uh, law enforcement believes this guy killed my sister or a copycat killer. Anyway, my, after this phone call, my mom goes into a deep depression. Not many days in her life that are happy after that. But there came a time when she was happy. June of 1991, that's gonna, when I get married uh, out here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. My mom flies out for this week-long wedding celebration and for weeks the happiest I had seen my mom since that phone call. But the weekends, the celebration ends, my mom flies back home to Washington State where she's living at the time, goes back into depression. Just a few months later in the fall of 91, I'd be in graduate school at Michigan State. Um, my mom and I are separated by 1,500 plus miles, so we talk on the phone every week. On this particular phone call in late October 91, we're talking and we're sharing uh, what's going on in our lives. And as we're about to close, before we hang up, my mom says to me, she says, Long, my Vietnamese name, Long, you have Donna to take care of you now. And we hang up. A week later, I get a phone call from Washington State. I expect it to be my mom, 
but it turns out to be a detective from the King, uh, from the Benton County Sheriff's Department where my mom was living at the time. And in so many words, the detective says to me, Mr. Robbins, we have some unfortunate news. We just found your mom and she was hanging in her shower. A week after my mom says to me, you have Donna to take care of you now, my mom takes her own life. It was my mom's suicide that launched me on this path of doing this type of work. It happened the first semester of graduate school for me. It's that one single incident alone that led me to study what I studied in graduate school about how the brain processes outsiders and strangers and how we, after processing that information, how we treat people, right? Uh, and so people call me a diversity and inclusion guy. I study human behavior. It just so happens some of the things I study uh, apply to many things, including diversity and inclusion. And if, 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 if I don't get a chance to say it, I'll, I'll say it right now. I think we've, we've, we've made the work of diversity and inclusion way too complex. It all comes down to this. Are you a caring person? You care about other people, right? But with this thought in mind, the true measure of a caring person is not how well, how well you care for your friends and your homies. The true measure of a caring person is how well you care for strangers and outsiders. That's the true measure. And the cool part about that is this, the more you care for strangers and outsiders, the more friends and homies you get. Right, so right. we went all around, right? Right? Sure. So people look at me and they, they don't see the psychological and physical scars um, that brought me to where I am today. And, and that's just a note for all of us to get to know other people's stories before we um, make assumptions about them. So Steve, when, when you and I met and I was able to observe you doing your thing the first time, you said something that was very impactful uh, and I didn't forget it. I don't want you to talk about it. All right. You said the work of diversity, and I'm paraphrasing here, the work of diversity is lost unless you have the work of inclusion. Yeah. You can have more diversity, yeah. but unless yeah. you don't, unless you work on being yeah. inclusive, you right. may, you, you tend to cause more problems yeah. The more diversity that that you pursue, yeah, can I unfold that for us so that our audience can get a different perspective yeah. on diversity and inclusion work. Oftentimes, when you hear those two words, diversity and inclusion, you hear them in that order. I tell people I'm I'm not a diversity and inclusion guy. I am an inclusion and diversity guy. Not because I value one more or less than the other. So people don't interpret that, uh, that as I value something less than the other. Right? It's because the research suggests to us this. If you don't build an environment, a culture of inclusion, diversity actually makes it worse. And, and here, imagine a homogeneous group of people. Imagine a group of people who are very similar and they don't get along. Guess what happens when you bring different people into that mix? Well, one of the things we observe is some of the people who formerly did not get along, some of them start to get along. And guess what they do? They attack the new people coming in. They gang up on the new people coming in. So it's very hard on the outsider, the stranger, uh, coming into that, to, into that group. And, and, and so it, it's a stepwise progression for me. It's like baking a cake. If you do steps three or four step, before steps one or two, um, then the cake's not gonna turn out very well. But all the steps are important, right? And sometimes because of the way diversity was, uh, was started out early on in the, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, we, we, we got this, this idea of diversity in mind, and it's about social justice, and it needs to be about social justice. But one way we measured a, a, a proxy, an indicator of social justice was numbers of people in categories. And we never asked why we were doing that. It's easy to count people, right? It's easy to count people. Diversity is about counting people. Inclusion is about making people count. Awesome. I, I so love the way you explained that. And I remember the audience that we ran <clears throat> was pretty mixed, <laughs> right? Uh, at the time that I heard this for the first time. And I remember the reactions there and how people's minds started changing. The conversation started changing. And uh, just for the sake of context, it was a pretty conservative audience. Yeah. It, and it was amazing how they shifted my thought and it shifted the thoughts of, of, of people in the, in the organization. How's COVID impacted your work, Steve? Well, it's, uh, <laughs> I have this now, a studio. No, I, I had this, 
Fortunately, I was prepared. I had a video production studio in the, uh, before COVID hit because I did uh, videos for my clients. Um, and so I was already set. Um, it's, 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 it's made it kind of easier for me. I don't have to travel as much. Uh, before I'd be on the road Monday through Friday, be in different cities uh, every, almost every single day. I, I was like a touring artist, but I couldn't sing. So, <laughs> and so it's so I get to stay home now. I can stay home and do this, and and actually, actually, um, it, it has turned out very well. The the most frequent rec um, remark I get after a workshop that I do virtually, whether it's um, an hour, two hours, or six hours long, is it went by so fast, we needed more time. So yeah. it's not, it's, it, it's in part the, the technology and the vehicle, but it's also in part the people who are in it. Not only me, but the people who interact uh, with me uh, during the workshop or meeting. So um, <clears throat> this is gonna be a, a bit of an unveiling and I feel comfortable okay. doing it because I saw that you uh, sent a release on social media. So I'm gonna put you on the spot and I'm right. so excited to be able to do this for you, Steve. Uh, in 2021, yeah. you will be launching Inclusion University. Please Inclusion tell Academy. us, Inclusion, Inclusion Academy. Academy. Thank you for the correction. The, from the first, from the first message. Oh, okay, right. Thank you so yeah. much. I appreciate yeah. that. So thank you for the correction. So Inclusion Academy, tell us about Inclusion Academy. Okay, so I've been doing this work for a couple of decades and I, one of the things I've noticed and has said to me uh, by many people doing this work in organizations is it's very tiring. It's very tiring, right? And it's very hard. And so part of this work is group therapy for people in Inclusion <laughs> Academy. Uh, so it's, it's the CDOs or people in charge of, of inclusion and diversity in their organizations to come meet on a regular basis to talk about their their wins and, and their defeats and how to, how to move forward. The other piece is about learning continuous learning for the people who are in charge of this and learning from a, from a science perspective. As maybe you can uh, attest to this, I'm relatively unique in the way I approach inclusion and diversity. You've worked with a lot of folks in this field, bringing them to your organizations you've been a part of. And I come at it from a science, neuroscience, behavioral economics approach. And, and most people don't. They don't have the background and the training that I have. It allows me to give them a different look, like inclusion and diversity instead of diversity and inclusion first, and come right. at it with science-based research um, that helps them to understand that, that yes, there's a, there's a huge social justice component of inclusion and diversity, but to do that social justice work well, we have to come at it from, from different angles and from different perspectives. One of those perspectives is, for me, is around brain science and behavioral economics. Um, and so, it's a year-long and even further academy, inclusion academy, for people that I call tall trees. Uh, tall trees is, is uh, my mom used to say to me when I was growing up, tall trees face strong winds. Tall trees face strong winds. Never really knew what she meant when she was saying because I was little, but I picked it up over time. And it, she was kind of saying this, you're going to face strong winds in life. Some of those winds are going to be a, a lot about injustice. Be a tall tree. And, and I tell people, um, be a tall tree knowing that other tall trees are standing with you, even though if you, you don't see them. They're there with you. And we're going to be tall trees together in this Inclusion Academy so that we can all do the work together to make this world a better place, not just our organizations. So it's about, it's about continuous learning, therapy, and helping your organization get better at this work. I love it. I'm sure I'll be a student of yours at some point. Um, I've already learned so much from you so, so far. When, when we had the immersion of, or I should say the emergence of Black Lives Matter movement over the summer, I'm sure you got a lot of calls. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. When we had the, the activities happen on the Capitol last week, I'm sure you got a lot of calls. Yeah. Tell us how you've been able to use what you do to calm, to connect, to yeah. give people confidence, give people hope that there's a way, way forward. Yeah. So, so let me let me use my board here, right? Please, yes. Um, so let me let me let me way oversimplify what's going on in people's brains. <laughs> <laughs> when something when something bad like January six happens in our society, so we, we have this we have this event here, right? And 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 so the signal gets the signal gets passed down to this 
place called the amygdala. <laughs> and it, this is part of our uh, uh, ami amygdala. This is part of our ancient brain, our, our older brain. It's our fight or flight center, right? And it processes information a lot faster. It processes information a lot faster than the prefrontal cortex, which is, uh, which is the newer part of our brain. This is your thinking brain. And what happens uh, in a general sense is people, an event happened like January 6th, and people go, we got to do something, we got to do something. Their fight or flight center launched, and they called someone like me to help them. And what I do is say, hey, start thinking so you calm down this fight or flight center, and let's approach this in a way that's thoughtful. And, and part of that approach is people want to react to what's going on in our world right now with issues of diversity and inclusion. I, I know why they do. I try to get them to think about, you want to build an environment or a culture so that whenever anything like this comes up, you're prepared for it. Don't just react to what we researchers call a historical artifact. Be prepared, build a culture so that when things happen in our world, and they will happen, we see it over and over, you're prepared as best you can. So whether it's, whether it's uh, uh, Black Lives Matter, racial justice issues, or LGBT issues, or political issues, you're, you're as best prepared as you can be to address them with your organization. That's the main, that's the main uh, thing I tell people first is to be calm. Be calm. Because when you're stressed, your amygdala take, uh, takes over, you're, you're very uh, narrowly focused on the event at hand. And what happens is we, we don't think about unintended consequences of those particular actions that might help in the moment at that time. Steve, uh, tell us, give us a testimony. Give us a situation where you encountered somebody called you or somebody asked you to come in and do some training for them. And at first blush, you thought, oh my goodness, this is, this is way above you know, what I thought I'd be taking on. Give us, give us a good news testimony that you've encountered during your career. Uh, well, I mean, it just, I mean, it's a lot, a lot of it happens, a lot has happened just recently where people, you know, with these events in our society, and people call me and they'll, we, we, they'll, they'll say something like this, we need, we need to put a statement out there about where our organization is. And I go, yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe. If you, do, if you do put a statement out there, make sure that you can back up that statement. <laughs> uh, because people look at your words and your actions, right? But even then, I bring them back to, we gotta get back to fundamentals. If we wanna build, yes, make your statement, tell, tell, tell society, the public, your constituents, your clients, where you are at on these issues, and make a bold statement, but be prepared to back up your boldness. Uh, but then I tell them, you gotta work on some fundamentals. And the fundamentals I work on, in, on issues of inclusion and diversity, are about being open-minded. That's where you get this on, be curious. The, the great attribute of an open-minded person is curiosity. So curio uh, open-mindedness operationalized is curiosity. And then the other, the other fundamental is uh, a mindful engagement. Be more mindful, right? You need to be open-minded because closed-minded people suck in diverse <laughs> environments. <laughs> Is that, your, is that your technical word? Is, is, is that your academic assessment that there? That is my technical <laughs> word. My <laughs> academic PhD suck. So <laughs> write that down, write that down. I got uh, it, I got uh, it. <laughs> and then, uh, so, um, like, diversity, when you have a bunch of people who are represent different perspectives, diversity plus closed-mindedness, what is the outcome of that? That's what we call the United States Congress. That's, that's <laughs> no, no. Diversity plus closed-mindedness. Uh, the outcome is usually misunderstanding, miscommunication, and conflict. But you can keep the people the same. But if you uh, help them to practice, become more open-minded. Diversity plus open-mindedness is better. Uh, people better at adapting to change. The continuous learners organizations of people who are better at creativity, innovation, inclusion, and diversity. But recognize, we didn't change the people, we just had them become more open-minded. Mm. So, like in basketball, Tony, you and I like, yes. uh, like yes. sports, like basketball. Yes, sir. We, we can't run plays and run a strategy unless our players know how to dribble and pass. 
Absolutely. You tell organizations, you can have a great inclusion strategy, but if you can't be open-minded and be mindful, <laughs> you, can, your strategy, you can't execute the strategy, right? Mindfulness is really about self-awareness. I, I should say it's, it starts with self-awareness. So are you aware of yourself, how you process information? Are you aware of others, how they process information? And then that helps you to respond in a way that, that helps elevate the group and not just yourself. I mean, I can go into a lot more, but these are the two fundamentals I start with. It's like dribbling and passing in basketball. I love it. You've been doing this a long time. You, you started, I suppose, back in the 80s and, or 90s. 90s. And, now you, and now you are seeing, what, what are you seeing as trends in this work? I, you know, based on where you started and as we look forward, what, do, what, are we, what are we moving from? I hear a lot of people in the diversity and inclusion space use the term moving the needle. Right, which, which attributes, which is, which is an attribution to, we started in one place, we've gotten better, a lot, lot more work to do, yeah. but we've yeah. moved the needle. From your perspective, based on the work that you've done over the years, how have we moved the needle? We've gotten more aware of the issue, <laughs> how problematic okay. it is, but that's different than being uh, effective at addressing the issue. Okay. Okay. All right. And what I mean by that is we have to go back in history. So the work of diversity and inclusion really got to start in organizations in the United States in the 70s and 80s. The two, the two catalysts for that, at least based on my research, are the civil rights movement and the women's movement. Right? The civil rights movement and the women's movement got people started to think about equity and fairness and social justice. Social justice. So think about this. I'm oversimplifying things, but think about this. The work of diversity and inclusion when it got to start was all about social justice. Does that make sense? Yes. The problem is some people think the world is already just. Right. And when you, when you present a social justice approach to them, they, they're, they're the ones in the workshop going, this is a waste of time. Why do you have me here? The world's already just. And in, in, in their mind, in their framework of the world, their mind's going, the world is just, if there is a disparity, it's because people, some people don't work hard enough. Right. They don't pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. So the social justice approach is actually still dominant in, uh, in, in the, the approach today. And it doesn't work for many audiences. Uh, we still, I don't, again, don't take me as saying, I don't think we need to do this. I think we need to do this work, but we have to know the audience we're working with, right? I come at it from a science approach and then I can, with my science approach, I've been able to open people's minds so that they walk through the door and then the social justice approach seems more uh, uh, palatable to them. Gotcha. Uh, social justice approach, we talk about diversity a lot. We count people. How many, how many men do we have? How many women? How many people of color? Asians, blacks, uh, uh, gay, lesbian, LGBTQ folks, right? Uh, but that has nothing to do with inclusion. I say diversity without inclusion is just about optics. Inclu but inclusion without diversity is just bad optics because you know what? Optics still matter in our world. We still judge people and organizations by the way they look, but we have to bring those two together. We have to bring those two together. We just can't emphasize filling up categories. I, I cringe when I hear a CEO say, by this year, we're going to have this many women. Right. <laughs> that, 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 that's, that's, that's good, but, but you got to add some pieces to that. Right. Why are you going to have this many uh, women? Uh, what's, the, what's the reasoning there? Is it just for diversity's sake? Because if it's just for diversity's sake and you haven't built the right environment, it's very painful for the women you're bringing in there. Right. right. Well, Steve, listen, I am a supporter of your work. What's next for you? You've, you've got Inclusion uh, Academy coming out. Um, uh, I have your What If book on my shelf. <laughs> I've referred to it shameless, many shameless times. Plug, plug, tell you what, shameless plug. Tell us, tell us a little bit about What If. What, if this, what you see is the, the 10th anniversary edition of the book. It's 35 short stories 
uh, where you learn about me and my family. A lot, most of the stories are true, uh, true, is, are true stories. Uh, so, some of my kids don't like me telling those stories, but that's why they're, <laughs> that's what pays for college, right? So, right, right. <laughs> um, so and, and each story, they're only like two to four pages long, easy, easy read. Uh, and then each story comes with questions, activities to, uh, um, to address with, within yourself internally or with a group of people. A example, the first story in my book is called The Right Environment. Uh, in that book, I talk about a pond we have in our property. Whoever built the pond previously built, uh, built it for a certain type of fish, like bass and sunfish. Well, mm -hmm. I wanted to put trout in it, and before I made the, the environment good enough for the trout to survive in because trout need different environments than, um, than bass and sunfish. The 200 trout I put in there died within three weeks. Oh my I use that story to suggest that even when you want new people in, new trout in, unless you're willing to prepare the environment for them, they're not gonna last very long. Not yeah. because they don't have the skills and the abilities and the resilience and grit, it's because you, you made an environment that, that's toxic for them. That, Although that it's is not awesome. for somebody else. Right. It, it, the same environment that may uh, help one flourish yeah. may be toxic to somebody else. And it's yeah. really about looking at the holistic nature of the environment right. to make sure that it's it's palatable to everyone. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, yeah. Cheap, cheap on Amazon. Cheap on Amazon. Never buy it from retail. <laughs> Amazon Prime. Cheap. And the next time I see you, I'm going to get a signed copy. That's, that's a right. fact. You got it. So uh, as with all of our Black Lives Matter radio shows, Hope gets the last word. She is the person who came to me shortly after George Floyd was killed. Hope had a lot of questions. And we've had a lot of dialogue trying to close this gap. As you say, uh, the difference between being open-minded and closed-minded and really opening you, yourself up to understand. So Hope has been somebody that I have really try to provide as much information as I can to just from a perspective, um, you know, as a lived experiencer. And Hope has decided to be an enduring ally, <laughs> right? Yeah, there and go. so uh, she is fantastic. She has done the work and has continues to do the work to gain a better understanding, to see the world differently from uh, a different lens. And so as with all of our radio shows, it is our tradition that she gets the last question. So Hope, right. over to you. Well, thank away, you, Hope. Tony. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you, Steve, for being here. It's really amazing to hear your story. Um, it's so, um, you know, pulls at your heartstrings to hear about your early family experience. Thank and you. I'm, I'm sorry for that for you. But I'm really glad that you've taken it and made it so powerful for all of us to come along this ride with you. Um, so I have, my last question is to talk a little bit about your entrepreneurship. So in addition to having a consulting firm and working with organizations around the world and being a professor and an author, I, I do love your book and that idea. You also have a production company. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, up until COVID, <laughs> with the production companies on, on, on uh, kind of uh, temporary uh, set aside right now, but up until COVID, I had um, um, five women um, who who would produce short stories, um, short films, um, and obviously they would also we would produce uh, videos for clients. But I had five women because in the film industry, um, even when they had four-year degrees from top schools male people in film who do the hiring saw them as makeup artists. Wow. So I, I wanted to give folks an opportunity, in this case women, an opportunity to show their talents without bias. Um, and the, the name of the video production company is S2S Studios. S2S, S2S stands for Something to Say Studios. Something to Say. Everybody has something to say. Not everybody has um, the, uh, the ability to, to say it or the vehicle to say it, uh, but we wanted to get those stories out. We're a storytelling company, basically, uh, and we want to tell people stories that can, that can help the world. 
Well, that's uh, that's exactly what we do here at Incandescent. We uh, yeah. help people raise their voices, and and I love how you're walking, you're talking every aspect of your business. It's really important, I think, for us, you know, an entrepreneur to be able to be what they are in every aspect of it. So you're, you know, we're really impressed and really proud to have you on our show, and we look forward to sharing your your lessons with um, with our viewers uh, throughout you know, as we move forward with the Black Lives Matter radio show. So I want to ask you the last question would be, so what do you see is coming, right? So you're helping people open their minds, be more mindful and integrate that into how they view the world. So we have a change of administration this week and we have a lot of tension in the Capitol right now and around the country. What are you forecasting? I, I don't know what I, I don't, I don't know what to predict, <laughs> but I know what I hope. I hope people become more what I call internally curious or people do introspection. Ask themselves why they believe the things that they believe, right? Do they believe it because they did some research, fact check, grabbed some third party independent data, ran it through a, a, a calculus, an algorithm and said, this is what I believe based on some, some good information or do they believe it because they read it on Facebook? <laughs> because a friend of theirs, this sound, and it sounded good to them when they heard it from their friend, uh, they go, okay, I'll, I'll believe that. They don't need fact checking. So I'm hoping we do some introspection, keeping, keeping the idea in mind that we're, in the United States, we're all U.S. Americans, and we should be standing up for one another, um, not divisive. See people, see people learn, to, uh, learn their stories so that you can interpret them better. Um, and not see them as the enemy. Some folks in our world would like to portray the other, the person who's not like us, as the enemy. And when the brain starts to see that as the enemy, no matter what the enemy says, the brain, uh, if we're not careful, not mindful, we process that what they say as bad information, no matter what they said. That's how the brain uh, tends to operate on an unconscious, at an unconscious level. If I don't like you, it doesn't matter what you say, unless I'm open-minded, I'm going to interpret what you say as bad. But if I like you, I'm going to try to find a way to believe you. I'm going to try to find a way to get on your side. Um, and so I, I try to, you know, I, I'm trying to do my part to make the world a better place one at a time, one organization at a time, just get people to become more introspective and open minded with the idea of, um, well, unity, yeah, unity and justice in mind. Yeah. Well, we give you all the uh, props we can to keep that going because I think we're all trying to move forward in that beautiful way, keeping minds open and hearts open too, right? So, Tony, I'm going to throw it back to you to close the show this evening. Yeah, so Steve, tell our listeners, tell everybody who's watching on Facebook Live right now, tell the people how they get involved with Inclusion Academy, how would they contact you? How do they get in, uh, uh, become a student? How do they get enrolled? Yeah, the, the, best, the best thing to do <laughs> is, uh, th thanks for, I didn't even pay you to set me up to make a pitch, <laughs> you know? Uh, just go to my website, www.slrobbins.com. And, um, and then pretty soon the full information will be up there. Right now, I've just been going to, to folks like yourself who know about it, my list. I haven't made it all public yet because it's really, <laughs> this will sound bad, it's exclusive. It's exclusive. It's not, <laughs> I, I love it's just it. Because, just because of time constraints and the, the, the people that I'm trying to target so that they have the biggest reach to others. Okay. Got you, so, got you. Yeah. Well, listen, man, it's always a pleasure to talk to you you know, whenever you and I get together, I'm always thinking we, we always have these short spans of time to connect, but there's yeah. so much to talk about. Right? Yeah. So <laughs> it's much. so much to catch up on. Um, but I do want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being a guest. I want to thank you for coming in. And the one thing I love most about you is that you are a teacher, you are an instructor. This is not just about diversity and inclusion, but it's really teaching people how to think differently. Yeah, yeah. And isn't that what it's all about? You talked earlier about the amygdala hijack and how really 
uh, people miss out on the fact that you can really program your own mind. You can program yeah. Yeah. yourself to process information on your terms and not necessarily be convinced to think like others or, or to right. get into this right. pack thinking or group think is, is yeah. uh, it's called. So thank you so much for coming on and expanding on that. Uh, you and I both know we're going to have a, a longer conversation at a different time, uh, but I appreciate you coming on and Welcome to the Black Lives Matter radio show family. We will surely have you back on uh, once Inclusion Academy really takes off. Right. Uh, but thank you again. Uh, Hope, over to you to close this out. Well, thank you, Tony. Thank you, Steve. Wishing you both safety this week. Uh, we don't quite know what's going to go on, but uh, <laughs> you know, hopefully we'll all hope for the best. Uh, calm, I like that idea of going to that smarter part of your brain and taking that deep breath right? Three deep yeah. breaths change everything. That's so right. you are listening to the Black Lives Matter radio show. Tonight's guest, Dr. Steve Robbins from Grand Rapids, Michigan, www.slrobbins.com. And that'll be in the liner notes on all of our articles on Incandescent Radio and Be Incandescent Health and Wellness magazine, where we'll be featuring him and these fantastic, this fantastic interview. So thank you, Tony. As always, you are a wonderful host. I'm so honored to be doing this show with you. And thank you to our Facebook friends. This was so much fun. And we come back every Sunday evening, 6 p.m. Eastern time. So we hope you tune in again next Sunday. Take good care. Be safe. Be well. <laughs>